Well, hey, biology, hope you're doing well when you watch this video and not going stir crazy inside, sheltering in place. I know today is rainy, but yeah, we got to get outside. It's so necessary for our mental well being. But today, guys, in this video, I'm going to cover chapter 18 evolution of populations. Um, lesson, the first lesson, and part um, of the second lesson as well. So in your book, the case study, you know, there's case studies at the start of each chapter. This, this chapter deals with antibiotic resistance in the case study. And I definitely want you to read about that because it's very important in the world that you will grow up and have a family in and live in antibiotic resistance. So first, I want you to define antibiotic resistance. Secondly, I want you to name three antibiotic resistant bacterial strains or bacteria. For example, you can't use this one, but for example, MRSA, M-R-S-A, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. That's an example of uh, bacteria that are resistant to uh, antibiotics. What do doctors do if you are infected with a superbug? A superbug is one of these like, you know, bacterial species that do not respond to many of the antibiotics. So what do they do though? How do you, they save your life? I mean, just imagine, right? Going into the hospital, you have a bacterial infection and the antibiotics that they give you aren't working. It'd be very scary. So what do they do to try to help you uh, survive? So 18.1 is about genes and variation. I would like for you to be able to define evolution in genetic terms, identify sources of genetic variation and explain what determines the phenotypes for a given trait. So when Darwin developed his theory, remember we've been learning about Darwin and evolution, he did not understand how heredity worked. This left him unable to explain a couple of things. First off, where this variation comes from. He saw variation, he just couldn't really explain where variation come from. And how inheritable traits pass from one generation to the next, like how certain traits pass from your parents to you. Um, so in the 1940s, Mendel's work on genetics was rediscovered. We already talked about Mendel, right? Mendel and his piece and you know uh, genetics the study of genetics father of genetics and so when studying evolution day biologists often focus on a particular population so evolution happens within population so how is evolution defined in genetic terms in genetic terms evolution is any change in the relative frequency or percentages of alleles in the gene pool of a population over time so evolution if allele frequencies are changing in a population, um, according to mathematical, you know, statistical analysis, um, it, evolution is happening. So genotype and phenotypes in evolution. Natural selection only acts on phenotypes, what organisms can physically see, not genotypes. And so some individuals have phenotypes that are better suited to their environment, and therefore those individuals, organisms, have a higher fitness level so so let's learn some vocabulary together population this was in, in ecology way back when we were actually in school i think we started learning about this in like september october but population let's review this is a group of individuals of the same species living in the same area that breed with each other so that group of zebra right there is a population so because of mutations which are changes in dna different forms of a gene or alleles may exist Diploid organisms, which means two copies, right? You get one from mom and one from dad, contain two alleles for each specific gene. So all of these alleles combined are put in, inside of a certain population, are put inside something called a gene pool. These, this is the sum of all copies of all alleles at all loci or locations on the genome on DNA in a population. So the little comic here is, hey, you, get out of the, get out of the gene pool. I don't know if you ever heard like a lifeguard talk like that, like, yo, hey, you. Stop splashing around. I don't know. It's, it's, I'm not, you know, it's been a long time since I've been to a pool with a lifeguard. So anyways, allele frequency is a proportion of each allele in the gene pool. And then genotype frequency, proportion of each genotype. And I'll help, I'll show you some pictures to help you understand this. So first off, a gene pool is the combined genetic information for all members of a population. So you can see that all the different alleles that this population possesses genetically, all those combined is considered the gene pool. So for example here, this is a picture from your book. Let's say that homozygous brown, homozygous back and heterozygous, so obviously black is dominant to brown in this. But you can see that the frequency of alleles, well, how many brown alleles are there compared to black? Well, you can see that brown alleles outnumber black alleles in this uh, mouse population. And so when scientists try to determine if a population is evolving, they look at allele 
frequencies. They, that's what they look at. So one form of a gene is an allele, and this is a review from Mendelian genetics, but an allele is, you know, remember he dealt with purple and white flowers, um, and so those are alleles. So that's the locus for the gene, so this is the location, and at this certain location, you have two alleles, purple or white, for uh, the Mendelian pea plants. So relative frequency of an allele is the number of times an allele occurs in the gene pool. So this is like a percentage. So in this example right here, 70% would be the capital allele B, and 30% would be the lower, you know, maybe possibly recessive allele little b. And so that's just another picture right there. But you can see um, from an older textbook, but you can see that the brown alleles outnumber the black alleles. And so what scientists would look at is if something was happening in this mouse population, and more, you know, um, brown mice was there, so there was hardly any black ones left, they would consider that evolution because the allele frequencies would be changing. This is another picture in your book. Um, you can see that that white deer right there, that's an example of mutation. So where does this genetic variation come from? Well, it comes from mutations. So, for example, that's, that white deer would not blend in very well. Sometimes it would really stand out. It would have a lower fitness level than its you know, family members next to it. Um, bacteria can develop mutations, which cause them to be resistant to, resistant to antibiotics, which hopefully you've read about and done some research on. And then in, in college, I, I found this hilarious that a puggle was a picture in your book. But in college, my roommate, his girlfriend, soon to be fiance, now his wife, uh, they had a puggle um, named Lily. And she uh, peed on the carpet a lot. But, uh, you know, it was really, she was, she was a great dog. Um, but puggles is a result of breeding a pug and a beagle together. And they're really cute. I mean, like baby puggles are just like ridiculously cute. But yeah, that is another example of genetic variation, which is sexual reproduction. And so let's go through how genetic variation works. Mutations are the first source of genetic variation. This is any change in a DNA sequence. So they can occur due to mistakes, due to environmental chemicals, due to food, due to radiation levels. But any time that there's changes in DNA sequences, those are mutations. Now, by large, you know, there is, most mutations are neutral or, or um, bad. They don't help an organism. Usually they don't really do anything good or bad. Most of the time they're bad, but there are few of them would confer an advantage. Uh, and of course, this is another argument to, you know, debate to have, you know, how in the world could all these beneficial mutations happen over all these years if all we see today, the majority of them are not good for us, our organisms, or life. Uh, genetic recombination happens in sexual reproduction. Okay, sorry about that extra G there. What's awesome about videos is that you can just kind of change right when you're doing it. Um, so it happens during meiosis. So crossing over, crossing over, you can see it's happening right here where, where alleles, uh, you know, switch places to increase genetic diversity and also independent assortment so you know when certain genes and alleles are not linked and so sexual reproduction is a major source of variation in organism and you see this if you have a brother or sister y'all y'all have similarities but you also have differences you you get all your alleles from mom and dad but however you're not clones of mom and dad and why did that happen was well, because sexual uh, reproduction re rearranging these genes with other genes to help you know, see, uh, create a different combination, which is you. So the allele frequency doesn't change, though. Like, there's still the same amount of allele frequencies, just the way they're combined could be different and lead to different traits being uh, seen. So the final one that your book talks about is lateral, something called lateral gene transfer. And this is when DNA is transferred laterally. So vertically would be like mom and dad give it to their kids, and those kids have kids, and they pass it on. Um, to their offspring, of course, and then keeps going down the generations. Um, so the transmission of DNA between different genomes. And so in a horizontal gene transfer, so you have the DNA, you know, sometimes you can pick it up from the environment, it's transformation, we already learned about that, Griffith, Avery. Conjugation is when two uh, bacteria, uh, bacteria combine and exchange genetic information. That's sometimes how antibiotic resistance develops. And then transduction would be involving a bacteriophage, which is a virus that infects bacteria. But that is lateral gene transfer. So vertical would be like parents and dads to their offspring, to their kids, and those kids grow up and then have kids of their own. And then that's, that's vertical. Or, and then lateral would be, you know, between 
different genomes of organisms. And then your book starts talking about, well, let's talk about phenotypes, right? So single gene traits are controlled by a gene, a single gene with just two alleles. So we consider this like Mendelian uh, genetics, you know, just straight. And some examples of that in the human species is like rolling in the tongue, uh, hairline, widow's peak. I was going to say winged peak. I'm like, that's not a winged peak. Widow's peak, hitchhiker's thumb, being able to like, let me see, bend that, bend that thumb. I had one student one time who got like almost go 90 degrees. It was like very impressive and also a little scary, but you know, nonetheless. Um, these are examples as well. These snails right here, a single gene with two alleles controls whether or not a snail's shell has bands. And so you can see in this population right here with bands is by far more prevalent than without bands. But that's also just one location. Now poly, poly means many. So these are controlled by two or more genes. And these are, you know, the more complex traits, you know, the height, hair color, skin color, eye color. These are controlled by multiple different places in our genome. Most human traits are polygenic. We're very complicated, you know, uh, organisms. And so, but here's an example of height. So this is from a textbook right here, a, a, you know, a class. But you can see that the majority of people, kind of like a bell curve, right? Let's, let's draw this real quick. But you can see that the majority of people, it kind of like, it looks like this, and then it kind of goes down. And if you've been watching the news, you've been seeing bell curves a lot lately. Um, but the majority is in the middle. So the five footers and the six fives, and not many of them, the majority are in the middle. And so that's an example of a polygenic trait. So do the following graphs, so just kind of let's quiz ourselves for a second. Do the following graphs show the distribution of phenotypes for single gene or polygene traits? So this graph in this graph what do you think you can pause the video and see if you know the answer or not but i'll go ahead and show you the answer um the bar, you know these two this bar graph here single gene because there's only two possible outcomes you know polygenic would be like a wide variety of outcomes multiple many different phenotypes are possible and so that would be an example of your bell curve so questions part two a black guinea pig and a white guinea pig mate and have offspring all the offspring are black Okay, so that's like a little key here. Uh, is the trait of coat color probably a single gene trait or a polygenic trait? Okay, and why do you know why do you think that? Explain how mutations are important in the process of biological evolution. Think about how mutations affect genetic variation. So I need a couple of sentences for each one of those um, questions. Part two, questions part three, right? <laughs> right after that is uh, understanding allele frequencies. So. Allele frequency is a measure of how many of a given allele are found in the gene pool of a population. You definitely need to know that definition. As the population evolves, certain alleles may become more or less common over time. Changing allele frequencies is evidence of evolution. So in humans, the trait of polydactylism, having more than five fingers, high, high six, you know, never had a high six, um, is a dominant trait. So it's dominant. But very few people have this trait. So I want you to explain in your own words why a dominant trait is not always a common trait, or if when you advance onto a higher level biology course, they would say wild type. What does this mean about the relationship between an allele's frequency and its likelihood of being dominant? So I want you to give me a couple of good sentences, good thoughts right there as far as that question goes. So if you, uh, I don't know if you've ever been near vast fields and farms, but this is called crop dusting. Um, and what they're doing is they're spraying, could be multiple different things, but we'll just say it's an insecticide on this flowering uh, field here. And so, but insecticides, so what science has found is that insecticides, of course, kill insects, pesticides, kill pests, insects. And, but what they've found is that eventually insects um, change and they become resistant to the insecticides, much like bacteria become resistant to antibiotics. And so I want you to do a little research for that. How do insects become resistant to pesticides? What exactly must happen for insects to become resistant. And then give me two examples, like two actual real life examples of, okay, yeah, we uh, farmers, scientists were using this in a pesticide and this species evolved and now no longer this pesticide works anymore. So who have developed resistance to insects? So give me two actual examples from life. So this is the start of lesson two, okay? So I, in this lesson, I'm gonna hopefully help you explain how natural selection affects single gene and polygenic traits. I would help, I want to help you describe genetic drift, and then I'll explain how different factors affect genetic equilibrium eventually. That's Hardy Weinberg back in 
but that's going to be a whole separate video so i'm not going to cover that one today in this video but so natural selection on single gene traits can lead to changes in allele frequency so let's take an example of lizards okay so you can see right here that this bird's chowing down on a lizard what's for dinner everybody has to eat right um but the initial population you had like tannish ones red red ones black ones okay and you can see that the red ones were super easy to spot um done you know sometimes bright colors mean danger and poison but it didn't in this case so we're done and you can see that after 10 generations it was 80 percent 20 percent after 20 generations 70 30 and then after 30 generations 40 60 is evolution happening here and scientists would say yes allele frequencies are changing but why would allele frequencies be changing? Why, what possible advantage would the black lizards have? And a key and a hint here is that are lizards cold blood or, or warm blood? Um, do they regulate their internal temperature or does the environment kind of affect how warm or cold they are? And so the answer is that they are cold blood, which means they have to warm and cool themselves off via sunlight and shade and various, various methods. So the black ones, how would the, why would the black ones have an advantage? you know theoretically hypothetically well because they possibly could absorb more light you know more heat have more energy necessary to escape capture again that's just hypothetical in this situation but let's take another uh, hypothetical situation natural selection acts on phenotypes for example let's say you're a hawk and you're hungry and you're and you see these uh, mice in a forest which one would you go for you're gonna see the white one first right and so that the, the hawk's not looking at DNA. I mean, this sounds obviously silly, but it's it helps us understand evolution. The hawk's not looking at DNA. The hawk's looking at what it can physically see. And so it can see the white mouse a lot better than that little cute brown mouse. And so that is going to affect its choice and therefore over time will affect um, the population and how it evolves. So again, it doesn't see it doesn't see homozygous, it doesn't see heterozygous. It literally just sees white and brown. And so the brown ones would eventually become more dominant. So natural selection can act on quantitative traits in three, three, three ways. English, let's speak English. Quantitative numbers, like, you know, data here. Stabilizing, directional, and disruptive. You have to be able to contrast these three for me. So stabilizing selection favors averages, you know, the means. Directional selection favors individuals that vary in one direction from the mean. So you have the mean and you go one direction and that's what's favored. And I'll explain this with pictures to help you understand. And then disruptive selection favors the extremes, not the mean, but the extremes. And so let me show you some examples here. Um, here's a picture here. So stabilizing, the intervals close to the mean have the highest fitness level. The curve will eventually look like this. The curve doesn't go higher, it just gets narrower. Um, and so that is stabilizing. Directional, if individuals at one extreme have the highest fitness level away from the mean, then you will see that there's a shift, right? So more individuals are surviving down low. So there's a shift this way, evolutionary trend. And then disruptive, if the middle ones don't survive very well, but the extremes do, then you start having this, okay, there's the disruptive. You have this one, the extreme surviving more often than the average one. So let's take some examples to help us understand. Stabilizing selection, also known as purifying selection, a great example is birth weight for human babies. Um, example, let me show you this bar graph here. And so what you can see here is that the line represents mortality, which means the percent that tragically die due to complications. Well, around seven pounds, six, between you know, six and a half, give or take, six and a half to seven pounds, that's your mean birth weight. Mortality is the lowest between six, seven, I guess is the lowest, right, a little bit above seven right there. Maybe seven and a half. Can't really see that. But that's where the low is. Let's draw it. Let's draw it. I keep forgetting I have this tool. Right? You know, right there. We're we're really, you know, we're we're very low right there, the mortality, which is great, right? But so but what happens is is that if you're too small or even too large as a baby, your chance of, of perishing tragically go up. Um and so that is the percent of mortality that and it goes up dramatically so this would be stabilizing nature selects the means disruptive or i'm sorry just directional let's do directional first directional individuals at one extreme of a character uh contribute more offspring to the next generation so let's take a flower here 
the boar eating the, you know, this plant. But more spines would be harder to, for the animal to eat, right? Start sticking it, you wouldn't want to deal with it. So more spines would be a directional selection. So if you have more spines, you're going to survive if you're this plant. And so this is like positive selection. So what you see here, this was the initial, this was the initial population, but over generations, the number of spines, you know, increased. So this is evolution. Again, an example of this is longhorn cattle, Texas longhorns. Never been a Texas longhorn fan. Never lived in Texas. Drove across Texas one time, and it is, it takes an entire day to drive across Texas. Went out to El Paso. It's, uh, yeah, people are serious about football out there. But anyways, nonetheless, this is directional selection, longhorns. The longer the horns, the higher the chance of survival. What ha well, what happens is, is that predators out in the open are going to go for the, for the young one. That's, that's, not, that's not even a question. Um, you know, it's, they're easier to you know, capture, less energy, and so on and so forth. But what do longhorns come into? Well, that's protection. That's protection from, from defending young calves from predators. And so the longer the horns, the higher the fitness level of the surviving generations. And then finally, disruptive. Disruptive selection, individuals at opposite extremes of a character distribution contribute more offspring to the next generation. So it, it results in increased variation in the population and a bimodal distribution of traits. So for example, bill sizes in the black-bellied seed cracker, genus and species. I'm not going to try to say it. Py I'll, I'll try to say it. Pyrenestes ostrinus. I probably messed that up a little bit, but you know, I didn't practice. Uh, so you can see here that in this black-bellied seed cracker, smaller birds feed more efficiently on soft seeds. So on this you know, in this environment, there's soft seeds and there's hard seeds. So smaller bird build seeds, uh, build birds, <laughs> fe fe feed more efficiently on soft seeds. Okay, so they succeed. Small bills with soft seeds, you're good to go. Large build birds can crack hard seeds, so they're good to go with the hard seeds. They'll focus on the hard seeds and eat them. But however, birds with bills in like the middle, cannot really eat very well the soft ones or the large ones, and they'll struggle comparing, comparing, um, comparative to their other, you know, uh, colleagues, I guess. The small ones would succeed, small build birds would succeed soft, large build birds would succeed on the hard seeds, but the medium sized bills not going to work very well in this environment, okay? So that is an example of disruptive. Finally, the last thing we're going to talk about here is genetic drift. Genetic drift, random, the definition is random changes in allele frequencies from one generation to the next. So in small populations, it can create really big uh, dramatic changes. So for example, we have these group of butterflies, and these four butterflies die by chance. And so therefore, those alleles are lost from the generation. And so that leads to genetic drift. So there's two different types of genetic drift. First one is called bottle, uh, population bottleneck. So it's an environmental event that results in the survival of only a few individuals. So for example, let's, let's look at this graphic here. You have a lot of different alleles, equal frequencies of yellow to red uh, 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 alleles, okay? These alleles can mean anything, but we're just learning here. But something happens, and it's a, and it's a huge event, whether that's it's like a volcanic eruption, or predation, or something happens, but only a few individuals survive. They go through a bottleneck. You know, they go through like this filtering out process. But you can see here that the red ones, by chance, were the ones that, you know, the alleles that survived the, bo the bottleneck event. And so in future generations, as the population increases, the red allele is way more dominant than the yellow allele comparing the initial original population. So this is a bottleneck effect. A couple of examples of this is first off the greater prairie chicken. I love to go to Tennessee and this chicken was all over the place in Tennessee and Illinois, especially I think this, these facts are based in Illinois, but in Illinois, roughly 100 million birds in 1900, but fewer than 50 in the 90s. Uh, right now, there's very few individuals and they're trying to save them, but they, they show a, a very little genetic variation. Why is there so little of um, not many of them right now? Well, hunting, right? Chicken tastes good. Okay but there was, it was not responsible stewardship of the environment. And so now they're very, very low. Why is low genetic variation a problem? Well, because you don't, when you have low genetic variation, you can't withstand environmental stress very well. 
and you also have breeding problems and the young don't survive and and so it's there's just a lot of issues with it the bottleneck effect can also cause major change in low frequencies when populations decrease dramatically due to a catastrophe for example northern elephant seals were also on a near extinction about 20 individuals in the 1800s they estimate now 30,000 but there's no genetic variation in 24 genes so that genetic variation was lost and so here's some pictures of elephant seals only a face a mother could love I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But yet yeah, they hunted to near extinction. Seriously, population decreased, no genetic variation. So this is an example of a population bottleneck. We've lost a lot of alleles, and we would say due to again chance. So it's kind of like a um, you know a candy, you know gumball machine. Really, you have your original population, but you you just kind of turn it a few times for a catastrophic event. And whatever comes out is the foundation of the new population. That is the bottleneck effect. The last, the, the last example of genetic drift is called the founder effect. This is when genetic drift changes and frequencies when a few individuals colonize a new area. So you can see here all this variety, ancestral population, we have all this variety genetically. But in the new population, only a few individuals found this new population. And this new population does not have that much variety comparing, comparative to the original population. And so there's a, there's a famous example of this on the island called Tristan de, de Cunha. Tristan de Cunha. And anyways, 15 British colonists found this settlement. Where exactly is this? It's like really crazy remote, but look, right? I mean, you're like literally right in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean. 1,500 miles away from Cape Town, 2,000 miles away from Rio de Janeiro. 12, you are, that's, talk about isolation. If you want to get away from people, I mean, you'll still have people on the island, but if you want to get away from like big society, that's, this is where you go. You have to do a lot of fancy things to go here. I've, I've researched that a couple years ago, but anyways, nonetheless, one of the early colonists apparently carried a recessive allele for retinitis pigmentosa, a progressive form of blindness. So the founding colonists, 240 descendants on the island, four had retinitis pigmentosa. You're like, well, four out of 240, that's not very high. Well, it is comparing the entire, you know, what we see in, you know, on the mainlands. And it's 10 times higher on Tristan de Cunha than it is in population from which the founders came. So, again, this is an example of the founders effect. We see the founders effect in Amish populations. Uh, this is because they have grown from very few founders and they tend to marry within the community. So polydactylism are more common in Amish communities. Founder effect. There's a disease called maple syrup urine disease. You don't pro you don't have the correct metabolism as far as sugars go, and so you literally your urine smells sort of like maple syrup. It's not a good thing. You're like, dude, that would be cool. No, it's not. It's not. It's very uh, detrimental to your health. Affects roughly one out of 180,000. However, it has a much higher prevalence, which means it's high, in the Amish and Jewish descent and Mennonite communities just due to founder effect, um, you know, genetic drift. Also, there's a higher frequency of fumarase deficiency among 10,000 members of the fundamental church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So, 70, why is this? 75 to 80% of the community are blood relatives of just two men. Look at this, founder effect, right? John Y. Barlow and Joseph Smith Jessup. And so you can see that the founder effect affects communities and affects diseases and allele frequencies, which is of course important when we're talking about living um, life, you know, without disease and disorder, or, or do you have a greater chance of disease and disorder? Again, genetic diversity is very, very important on so many levels. So your last question, this will be the last slide today. Thank you for staying around one of my longer videos on YouTube. If you watch this, I'm so proud of you. Uh, questions, part five. The flood, let's, let's bring in the Bible. The flood in the Bible is one of the main events that has created the world we know today. Was this a bottleneck or founder effect on the human population? And I want you to defend your answer. So a few sentences there, show me some good thoughts and insights um, from your creative, well-educated minds. But anyways, until next time, guys, I hope this was helpful. I hope um, if, you know, if you have questions, let me know. Um, please do that. But until then, guys, God bless. Read your Bibles. Pray. Um, God is on the throne. He loves you so much. I'll talk to you later.